Hi, everybody. Welcome. Always happy to partner with ATYM. Um, Brandon and Matt are joining me today. My name's Haley Jones. We are from MRC Data, and I'm going to share a screen real quick. Um, just so you know, there is a chat box over on the right hand side of your screen if you'd like to throw out any questions. Um, today, we're going to go through a couple of mid year numbers in case you missed it from our mid year report. Uh, as I just said, joining us is Matt, who is our head of research. Um, I'm Haley, I'm head of independence at MRC, and Brandon is brand new on our research team. So, On the agenda, um, we're going to go through a couple of uh, slides, consumption data, sales data, streaming data. Um, we're going to talk about your point of differentiation and in practice what that might look like, how you can make some dollars. And then, of course, we're going to leave some time for Q&A at the end. So I thought we would start here. Um, from Music Connect market share report, this is year to date, so weeks one through 33, 2021 versus 2020 and 2019 represented with three colors here. So um, our full market share is in medium blue, like that's this number over here. And then we divided indies into a couple of different groups, like really DIY in the darkest blue and then uh, DIY plus indie labels that are distributed by a major. Um, and this gets a little intricate here. We sort of cherry picked some of those. So in other words, like ADA um, and Orchard are included in these numbers, but what's not included in these numbers are like an imprint on a major. Um, and I thought this is really interesting. This is a this is data and a slide that I know in my five years here, I haven't actually seen. Um, so. Indies are doing really well in a lot of ways, representing about a third of the industry. Yeah, and Haley, just to jump in here real quick. Um, again, like you're saying, this is a great slide to see um, really are you seeing the share uh, from the Indies. But uh, I can't help but notice that over the years, year over year trending, it looks a little flat, right? So we're only going from yep. when you look at the Indies distributed by a major, you're only seeing 32 to 34% growth and then back down to 33 for 2021. Is there any context added color you can add to that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So first and foremost, I rounded the numbers just for sake of fitting everything on a slide here. Um, so for example, look at total consumption, sales and streaming together. That's on the left-hand side of the slide. DIY plus Indies distributed by major goes from 33.78%. Um, it to which I rounded to 34, that was in 2020, down to 33% um, in 2021. And because this is sales and streaming together, what you don't see and what we are going to show you in a couple of slides is sales are way up, streaming is down just ever so slightly. And you can see that a little bit better on the right hand side of the slide. Um, and it's really hard to put onto a slide the amount of data, the amount of titles, the artists that we're dealing with here. Um, and it's hard to show. I think what's really important, especially when you're talking about the indie sector, is how big the long tail is, right? So I know a lot of people have heard this, and I heard it at Indie Week this year, something like 60,000 titles going on Spotify every day. And on our side at MRC, I know we're inputting like 1,000 to 1,500 titles every day. So there are some cases where we're missing some of those brand new titles, and um, it, it's we're processing something like 65 billion streams globally every single week. And it could be something as simple as grabbing an ISRC or tying all the ISRCs together. Um, there can be as many as 10 to 12 ISRCs per title. Um, and it's also difficult to show how big and to wrap your head around like how big three tenths of a percent, what that can represent. Um, and how much money that can represent. Like I also heard something about the three majors collectively pulled in like $15 billion from recorded music in 2020 to, uh, and it was $750 million in 2019. So big difference, right? Right, um, right. And, and I know, so, you know, we're always trying to, you know, optimize and make sure we're, we're capturing as much of the market as possible. And 
market share for indies is, is huge. Is there any way that we can, you know, improve upon um, the accuracy for these metrics? Um, yeah. I'm just curious there. Yeah. I think it's a really great question. And I know our job really is to show what's happening in the music industry. Uh, I think I know for a fact market share is a top priority for us at MRC. But again, so many moving parts. If there's one thing I've learned in in the last year and a half, it's like how quickly things can change. We've seen that with COVID. I think that's absolutely paralleled with what's happening in the music industry. So um, it's like, don't blink. Um, some of it is defining what is DIY, what's indie, once a major is handling dis distribution, how quickly an indie can change. Um, I think we see that frequently when an indie is actually DIY, but yet they, they get signed by a major and start going, when do we change that in the data? I think it's all of us in the music industry collectively getting together and making some decisions. So I think that can help us um, help us uh, do better. And again, I'm going to go back to tying all of the it's metadata. In some ways, this is a metadata challenge. So a benefit, for example, of using somebody like Orchard or ADA is that they're really good at dealing with the metadata. So but it's a great question and certainly a challenge in front of all of us. Metadata is a huge challenge for all of us in the music business right now. Perfect. Any questions popping up that I should know about? before I move on? No, I don't see much in the chat, so I think you can move forward. Okay, so here uh, is a little more to the story. Here's growth by total industry and each of its moving parts from 2020 to 2021. I like this slide um, because yeah, we would expect sales to be down. So notice digital albums, digital, digital tracks are down. This is for the whole industry, so not necessarily looking at indies here. Um, On-demand audio streams up 15%, but look at what happened to vinyl. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really exciting. So, and of course that jumps out on the slide the most. Um, yep. And it, I think it is, the murmurs have been circling across the industry. Um, but personally, I'm curious, you know, what type of vinyl sales are driving this, right? Like, are we talking about catalog vinyl sales? Or are we talking yeah. about new releases uh, and how does that kind of, how, how can I, how can the Indies get in that, in that conversation and where do they need to be focused on when it comes to these, this, this uptick, uptick in vinyl sales? Yeah. And we're going to show you a couple of slides on that. The answer is um, all of it. It's changing. I think in the past we used to really think of vinyl as the Beatles and a Fleetwood Mac record. Um, and that's not really the case um, in the last couple of years, but more so in 2021 than we've ever seen. Rock's still the biggest majority, um, but we're seeing hip hop titles, we're seeing new titles. And I'm gonna show you a slide in just a minute um, uh, for catalog versus current music. Um, awesome. And is yeah. there any yeah. it, quickly on catalog again and matt i think you're going to jump in here um the definition of catalog can you just reiterate kind of yeah. what that is matt if you want to jump in well haley's taking a sip thank it's, you uh, catalog for us in our definitions and in the data you're seeing uh is 18 months or older right um, and and one of the interesting things that haley brought up about you know frontline releases being a big piece of of what's driving a lot of that vinyl you know Obviously, there are co production constraints right now with vinyl, which yeah. um, giving labels a little bit of a Sophie's choice, <laughs> right? Like, do I do I push, you know, all of this great catalog that I know is going to sell? It's always sold, um, but it can be used to really strengthen a front line, line release. I mean, if you saw Billie Eilish's album launch in her first week, a huge chunk of of that consumption what helped push her to number one was were the vinyl sales. Yeah. Well, I think the next slide starts to tell a better story, especially for um, vinyl in the indie sector. Um, smaller pie, right? So we have huge growth, but when we're talking about sales and, and when we're talking about vinyl, it's definitely a smaller pie. So total market share here represents 11.5 million vinyl pieces sold um, year to date. So that's really right up to this week. Um, and look at the growth that's been happening. At least look at how big the bars are. Um, I like this. 
compared to last year. So huge boom happening in vinyl. But the important piece here for me is like the support there is from consumers for indie artists. Um, about a third of all sales, this is just vinyl sales that I'm showing you on the screen right now, but about a third of all sales, if I were showing you all sales are coming from the indie sector right now. And Haley, we got a question. Um, cassettes, any word there? <laughs> you know, it's funny. We don't actually break out cassettes um, in Music Connect. And I need to go look because I know we actually have that data. It's not, it hasn't been a super high demand, but perhaps since vinyl's coming back, cassettes will come back too. And maybe that'll be an addition we need to make. I haven't checked with our, uh, with our team for behind the scenes on cassettes, but it's a great question and one I can look into for sure. And Haley, um, have to mention it. Uh, do you think the pandemic is fueling any of this consumption? Absolutely. I mean, think about it. During the pandemic, a lot of people had, you know, a disposable income. They're used to spending it on music. They couldn't go to shows. So as more and more artists were getting creative and figuring out how to make a connection with their fans, I think that's part of what we're seeing here. I think the uh, hi-fi versus lower-fi conversation is kind of important and relevant here. Um, and something that I know the DSPs may respond to here in the near future. Um, but I think there's a lot of things going on. Big box stores were getting into the vinyl game. I think direct to consumer was really big um, in the last year and a half. And honestly, these numbers that I'm showing you, like the 2021, this is just year to date. It's versus year to date last year. So same time frame last year and same time frame in 2019. So yes, I think the pandemic does have a lot to do with it, but I don't think it's gonna go away. Awesome. And if I could add another point, um, you know, I think the fan is becoming a bit more uh, aware of how their favorite artists are being compensated. So when it comes to merch, when it comes to live performance, when it comes to physical uh, that can be bought in any form, I think there's more of a uh, understanding that they will get a larger piece of that pie. And one more point I'm going to make too before I move on. I know this shows 41% to 40%. Kind of a lot of the things is like, remember I rounded here. So this is actually a little bit closer than, than um, what you see on the screen. But total sales for indie artists, 25% to 28%, which is huge, represents a very high volume um, behind the scenes. So uh, I'm going to move on unless there are more questions. I'm going to go back to on-demand streaming here. I feel like a lot of people um, should know this and maybe do know this, but worth repeating. Um, Hip-hop definitely still kind of the leader in the game, but I like this slide because I feel like a lot of people think rock is dead, and it's so not. I think for the last many years, um, rock has been number two. Rock's actually gaining share when we're looking at just on-demand audio streams, and it's bigger than pop. Um, and as you're going to see here shortly, country and Latin um, really still in the game. Awesome. And on that note, right, uh, there's been huge buzz around country and Latin as a genre. Um, you know, it's kind of, I guess, you know, we're still seeing only 8% of that audio streaming. Yep. Um, but with the noise around country and Latin, I would expect that to be a bit larger. Um, so I'm wondering, is that relative share of the streaming universe? Is this, is this representative of where country and Latin are headed in the next few years? Um, I, I, can we, do you think that we can speak more to, to, to that? I think it's a perfect setup for the next slide. My gut feeling is those numbers are absolutely going to grow. But here's what the on-demand share changes look like by genre. Um, part of the growth in Latin and country to me, um, and feel free to chime in, Matt. I know you have a lot of research. You guys both look at a lot of research about this. Um, I think that community, the fans of Latin and country have been more the laggards, right? Um, hip hop were the early adopters to using streaming and the rock country and Latin fans are catching up. 
Yeah, and I think just looking at our research, if you just think about it from demographics, yep. um, the R&B, hip hop and EDM skew much younger, right? Than almost every other genre. Um, and it would stand to reason then that like the tech adoption curve for streaming was much higher among younger folks, right? So these genres that skew older like country and rock, this is in part a result of some of the streaming laggards finally getting onto streaming, um, mm -hmm. right? And so it's it's kind of the natural progression of what you would expect um, because yes. you know there aren't that many additional R&B hip hop fans that aren't already streaming, right? But also worth mentioning, I think in the country and Latin community, when I think about what's been happening during the pandemic, those many of those artists, not all of those artists, have done such an amazing job with keeping that connection with their fans, right? I'm thinking of Bad Bunny cruising around on the on top of a semi doing a concert through New York City, for example. Awesome. And Haley, just to interject real quick, we have a comment in the chat uh, wondering if this chart is uh, on U.S. data or is this global data? Yeah, great question. This is U.S. data. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And Matt, we really do see Latin exploding globally as well. Yep. Yeah. All just right. We're at a field in Latin America with our Music 360. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about old versus new um, and catalog versus current. Again, in our products, our definition of catalog is anything 18 months or older. And I know the question came up a little older or a little uh, a, a, a few minutes ago. Um, the industry, I feel like, is finally figuring out rediscovery is a thing. It's a big thing. Um, for many years, catalog has has outpaced current music. Um, but look at what's happening in 2021 so far. Total industry at the top, just showing you some of these growth genres right here. Hip hop, not on the slide, but if it were on the slide, you would see it right about 50%. Um, one of the interesting, interesting points to me is look at country. Country's kind of the anomaly here, getting more new rather than more catalog, whereas we see most genres getting more catalog right now. Awesome. And I mean, that kind of begs the question of uh, the the platform uh, to which rediscovery is occurring on or just discovery in general. So, right, it's like what, I, I'm thinking ra about radio and what's radio's role in today's um, discovery. Uh, yeah. and is radio being informed by streaming data? Uh, you know, what's happening there? It's a really good question. Um, I think uh, radio is definitely, well, not all programmers, many programmers are informed by streaming data and actually taking that into account. Um, there are some cases where we see radio still breaks music. I think that those cases are getting less um, and less and radio uh, can kind of take a take a new artist home or a new song home, but sometimes it's breaking on the streaming services before radio, which is really different, right? We haven't seen that happen before. Um, and notice, I, I think this is relevant for the radio conversation too. Part of, part of the reason maybe, or part of the answer as to why um, the industry looks a little more catalog right now is because during the pandemic, we've had less new releases. And you can see that here. So last year, about this time, 14% fewer. And so far in 2021, 19% fewer. So radio's response to that, by the way, in some cases, not all cases, is that they're playing more catalog. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Just pausing to see if there are any more questions before I move on. OK. No more um, Great to have all that data. What do we do with it? And when we were brainstorming for this webinar, we really were looking at some of the uh, exceptional cases. And we landed on this idea of vulnerability, authenticity, and bravery. Um, and I'll show you what we mean. And Matt, I know you're going to interject in here. How can you be different, right? One example, you're indie. Use that. Like, what's your brand? What are you going to stand for? And 
being indie is something, for example, Chance the Rapper stands for, uh, Brent Fias stands for. Um, and I think Chance the Rapper sometimes gets a bad rap when we're talking about indie. He's so often been referred to as an anomaly in the indie space. Um, and I think uh, that Brent really shows, look at the difference in those numbers, right? This is just year to date numbers. So Chance has 286 million streams year to date. That's audio and video, by the way. Uh, and Brent has 604 million streams. Both of these artists, I think when I think of their brands, part of their brands is they're independent and they're going to stay that way. They're kind of adamantly independent. Exactly. Brent has like, what, 10 million Spotify listeners. Um, another interesting thing I'll throw out, um, you know, as far as backing, um, he's working with a new startup called STEM. Have you heard about this new startup STEM? So STEM will actually offer financing based on your current streaming income and they do promotion too. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like Haley, there's a whole lot of, like, even just compared to three years ago, the number of resources that are available to indie artists to be able to essentially do all of the things that a major label would have done for them, right. right? Like I think some of this is just the natural progression of as the markets evolved and supported indie artists and given them the resources that they they need should they decide not to go. Right. Label. Yep. And STEM, I think there are many other companies like STEM and if if not yet, there will be. Um, the democratization of discovery. Um, a lot of people are interested in discovering new artists and new songs. And because of all of the changes happening, you have so many more resources now. You don't necessarily need a promotion team to take your music to radio. Um, social media is a great example. Um, Video has been, I mean, let's talk about TikTok. Let's talk about YouTube, where we are right now. Um, let's talk about Facebook video, Instagram video. I mean, there's a lot of ways that people can discover you now that I think have not been available in the past. Mm -hmm. And I would even say, um, just kind of think about this a little bit more, uh, when you have uh, an artist who is kind of, again, like speaking of, about vulnerability, authenticity, if they're authentically streamers, you know, if they're Twitch users, if they are on TikTok as consumers, and then they're also uh, producers, uh, you know, you're going to, there's going to, you're going to create that avidity towards your artists in a way that you may not have that level of flexibility at a major, right? You, yeah. you, you can be a bit more ad hoc, a bit more grassroots um, and organic about how you engage and interact with a current fan base or a new one that you're discovering just through your organic TikTok usage. Uh, and it doesn't have to be primarily music related, right? No, uh, I definitely not. I mean, go back to like Chance the Rapper and Brent Fias, like they're telling their story. Sometimes there are videos available, I believe I ran into it on TikTok, of Brent like literally recording um, uh, majors offering him, you know, huge, sums of money to sign and him saying, you know what, that's not really what I believe in. So you can tell your story. You can be authentic by using all of those new social channels. Exactly. Not just with releasing the music. Um, I know this is a little bit, uh, I, well, is it an old story? Is it still a new story? Just to, sh to illustrate um, how big of a driver TikTok can be. This is from Pofu's deathbed. Uh, this is weekly on demand streams. Um, and look at the peak. The peak happened um, shortly after that, after many people started using this song on TikTok, even before the EP was released. Nice. And now, are, do you believe that less people are using TikTok or videos now that we're getting out of our houses and we're not so kind of uh, pent up and having to find all alternative entertainment uh, avenues are, are do, do you see is that is that part of the decline there? Uh, well, this is from last year. 
So Matt, do you have any fresh data on that? Yeah, so I would, people's entertainment behaviors are changing, right? Um, yep. you know, a lot of movie theaters are opening back up, for example, you know, live shows are coming back. Um, we're keeping an eye on that into the fall, given everything that's going on with the Delta variant. Um, but we have tracked since the second week of lockdowns in the US um, back in March of 2020. Uh, we've had a what we call our COVID-19 entertainment tracker, which is a survey implement we use. Um, and, and it has been changing and it fluctuates, right? It, it hasn't just been a, everyone stops doing everything in person and starts doing everything virtual. And then we get through a major wave of, of COVID and then everything starts coming back. Um, some of these behaviors have stickiness. Um, I think if to you, me, TikTok's one of them for the record. Uh, like, I love TikTok. It makes me laugh. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think what's interesting is you're going to see things that are shorter form being stickier. Right. Because yep. with TikTok, it's not a question of, well, do I stay in all night on my phone looking at TikToks? I mean, sometimes it is. Let's be honest. <laughs> me too. Or do I do that? Or do I go out and see my friends and have dinner? Or do I go out to a show? Or do I go to a movie? Right. Like, Yep. Honestly, there are people in the movie theaters sitting there waiting for the, the movie to come on watching TikToks. Right. I think one of the, the strengths TikTok has going for it is it's that snackable content where it's like, it's not a massive time commitment like it is to sit down and binge watch the latest show on HBO Max, right? Yep. Well, and I know for me, TikTok is really a balance to news. I mean, right? I feel like there's so much negativity in the world. Like sometimes I'm like, oh, I just need to turn this, turn this thing around. So one of the reasons I appreciate TikTok. So getting back to being authentic. Yes. Yeah. So we wanted to share a, a quick example um, of what it means to be authentic and how you can lean into the indie brand. Um, we did an analysis of LGBTQ artists. Um, and what we found is that there are only 10 artists with over a hundred million streams year to date. This was done around like pride month time. Um, so those numbers, you know, are probably have probably grown, but this is an illustrative example, kind of that 80, 20 rule, right? So there's about 10 artists that kind of reach that huge appeal level. Um, but there are 45 artists with over a million streams. Um, so there are, there is a broad level of support for more independent artists. And it's just about finding that niche largely by being true to yourself and what, what like that artist brand is. So if we go to the next slide kind of looking at this further, you know, there is big support for smaller artists. So if we look at who was the fastest growing on a percent basis among LGBTQIA plus artists, um, Sophie was number one, rest in peace. Um, there was a, during this time period was the spike from after, after her passing. Um, but you can see quite a few smaller, more independent artists. Obviously Lil Nas X isn't one, but he didn't have a single <laughs> in 2020 during the time period we did the analysis. So, you know, having a major chart topping single will, will drive that percentage growth for you. Um, but one that we really wanted to focus on as an example of like a true independent artist uh, is Trixie Mattel. So if you're not familiar with Trixie, um, I think we've got some examples on the next slide. Uh, she is a drag queen uh, from RuPaul's Drag Race. She was uh, uh, competed season seven and then All Stars three. Um, and it's kind of a, a, a Jane of all trades. <laughs> so in addition to being a drag queen, puts out music, um, like, and not just like drag queen music where it's, you know, like rapping over a thumpa thumpa beat. It's like, she actually plays guitar um, and it's a lot of uh, acoustic music. Um, her latest release in the first five weeks of, um, of its, of its release streamed almost 5 million times. Um, and that is higher consumption than RuPaul's latest album who had a one year head start on that number. Oh, um, wow. Matt, so, do you think, 
Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but do you think that's a, the reason for that is like a collection of all the activities leading up to release? Um, and yeah, how, how can, how, like, how, how, do, how did that happen? Yeah, so I think, and this is kind of the point I wanted to get to here is that like Trixie knows her audience. So it's, she, she doesn't need a reason to go engage with them. She is constantly putting out content that like she, like, so she has her own cosmetics line. She has a YouTube video series. She has a podcast. Literally this week, she launched an online newsletter, uh, like lifestyle brand called Gooped, which is like a satire of Goop. Um, awesome. Did a collaboration with Orville Peck, which, I mean, you can see the numbers there drove, you know, almost a fifth of that consumption. Um, so it's, it comes down to knowing your fans and knowing what makes you special and different um, and constantly having something there to offer up to those fans, um, whether it's a collaboration, whether it's merch, whether it's, you know, having a very active social presence. You know, all the research we do always shows that consumers, you know, the music's table stakes. Consumers want to know the artist. They want like a sneak peek into their personal lives. They want to see their house. They want to meet their dog. They want to like, you know, what's your routine when you get up in the morning? <laughs> they, they do. I think that's a great, that, honestly, it's a great segue to um, what it looks like. How can you, how can you monetize all of those things? And so... Um, they were, that was a great setup. I had to take it. Yeah, no. And again, right. It's like at the end of the day, um, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to monetize? How are we going to make money off, yep. um, out, off of the, of the, off the opportunity? So, you know, just a few points here. Um, just wanted to sh shout out that 77% of podcast listeners are interested in the personality of the host, right? So, that is that drive is a key driver uh, to not only discovery but uh, retention um, of the artists and their work. Something being released uh, may not be aware of it until you hear it from your favorite podcaster. So that is a huge uh, source there. You know, we're also talking about live streamed events, right? So during the pandemic. 20% um, of consumers are watching live stream concerts in the past two weeks, right? So that this is, um, you know, something that you know, like, like consumers are and, and fans are looking for a way to engage the way they did before the pandemic um, when live events were, were uh, a very popular source of music consumption. So that number there, we're starting to see that decline slightly now that we're technically uh in, in some perceptions leaving or are kind of at the tail end of the pandemic who knows now with the delta variant lambda variant what's happening across the world that may change but uh it, it feels as if live streaming is still here and will be here for a while absolutely through the pandemic um and so moving on to so $140 is the average annual spend on artist merchandise again uh, fans wanting a piece of the action, wanting to feel that closeness to the artists, and part of that is merchandise. And um, finally, 60% of consumers um, would view a brand more favorably if they supported a social cause, especially if that cause is associated with their artists, the album release. Uh, we could think about uh, mental health issues, right? And that being at the forefront of not just music, but also sports. Um, so we're, we are seeing a high level of uh, engagement um, and understanding perceptions of what's occurring in the world and fans wanting to see their artists be a part of that. So um, those are a few metrics on like how we can leverage uh, the authentic and, 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 and vulnerable and confidence of, uh, of an artist and even an entire release strategy around those very authentic uh, pieces of the artist. Yeah, and just to jump in quickly, um, you know, there were a lot of um, a lot of brands and a lot of like music brands, in particularly, um, you know, the, the, some of the streamers put on live streams where like the the ticket price and the money raised actually went to benefit independent artists that that were essentially their livelihood was cut off because they couldn't perform. Um, 
we do have one question here. When was this this survey done? So this actually comes from a couple different surveys we've done. Um, the podcast metric comes from uh, our podcast 360 study, which was done um, at the beginning of April of this year. Uh, that 20% of consumers who watch live streams in the past two weeks, that was fielded in July. Uh, it's from our COVID-19 entertainment tracker. The third number there about merch is from our impending US Music 360 study. So you're actually getting a very early sneak peek. We actually don't release the report for another three weeks, but uh, that's from the, the data we just got back uh, from the end of July. Um, and then that last stat actually comes from a study we did last year during the pandemic, uh, actually on, on the Black Lives Matter movement um, and, and the role that music can play in, in, in moving uh, social and, and racial justice forward. I was thinking about um, getting creative and I don't know if you guys heard like what Lecrae did uh, last year and actually what Lecrae is doing right now. So Lecrae last year um, released a record first to the prison population before it was to the public. And he just launched an original hip hop track contest too. Again, um, to people who are incarcerated, somebody created the beats and he's asking um, for submissions, right? Submissions open to September 15th and that song's gonna get released. So talk about a way to find something that you're passionate about, a social cause that you're passionate about um, and then actually going out and doing something completely different and unique. Um, mm -hmm. and that was a great example. Kind of to give you another example too, um, definitely not an indie artist, but I don't know if anyone ha is aware, like Lil Wayne, he recently did a sit down with Emmanuel Acho. And if you're not aware of Emmanuel Acho, during the, d d in the past year or so, he's been uh, hosting a series called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black man now that he's trying he's trying to revamp that a bit and now it's more uncomfortable conversations with emmanuel acho the person uh but he sat down with little wayne recently and had a very frank and candid conversation about his mental health um and his uh, bout with um an attempt at suicide uh and it goes into painful detail um but it's it was very important it was very important to hear from what a lot of people consider a caricature of uh, the hip hop scene, but it, it really grounded Wayne for me. Uh, it gave me context uh, into his life and made me relate a little bit closer to him, right? So these are the kind of, uh, these are the kind of uh, activities and, and things that can be done to really have a genuine, um, you know, look at or, or it's to genuinely speak on what what artists are are what they care about or what they deal with on their day to day. So that will only help uh, with the exposure, the affinity towards uh, your artists, and so on and so forth. Great points. Uh, the last thing I want to show, we are doing a music manager's report for specifically for you in the indie community. Um, and we're going to give you, share with you some of that data um, from our COVID tracker study. And I, I'm hoping somebody can put a link to actually sign up if this is something that you're interested in. Um, but we'd love for you to have it. And if you are interested, just leave us your name and I'll reach back as the world hopefully gets back to some sense of normalcy. We'll see. As long as we're safe, as yep. long as we're all doing our part. <laughs> exactly. And then I left some room for Q and A at the end. And honestly, I'm gonna stop sharing a screen while we do that. But well, maybe I'll share a screen just for a second because here are our email addresses if you wanna reach out to any of us independently. Awesome just for one second. And then I'm gonna stop sharing so I can come back and look at people, hopefully. How do I stop? Sorry, stop there sharing. There we go. All awesome. right. Questions? I don't know where the, cause I was sharing. I don't know if I can see sure. anything. No, that I don't possible. see any just yet, but yeah, we're opening the floor to questions, uh, clarifications on any of the slides. Um, this is, we have plenty of time. I believe there's at least 15 minutes left. So um, we can definitely field some questions. Oh, it looks like Matt got kicked off too, unfortunately.
Got it. All right. Soon. So the newest questions are at the top, Brandon. Is that how it works? Yes, they should be. And right now it's just a link sent to everyone on okay. the user answers report. Yep. Um, well, if there are no questions, we don't have to hang out either. We appreciate everybody spending some time with us. Absolutely. Thank and you again, and Matt too for your help. Yeah, and again, please. Oh wait, I think we have one coming through. Do you have any global data you can share or US only? We do have global data. Um, but I don't have global market share. So it depends specifically like what part you were thinking you would like to see. Um, work in progress. Yeah. But we'll okay. definitely share that as it, as it happens. Yeah. And on the, the research side with our syndicated um, tools, there are, we, we, do, we do global research. So we may have a one sheet uh, to share with you uh, depending on you know, if there's any additional clarity or context that you have, that you need. Um, you know, it's interesting. Somebody brought up classical and I keep thinking about this. Um, I feel like, you know, we're seeing all this growth with country and Latin. And I feel like there are a couple of genres that are hanging out there still to come and classical and jazz are, are next. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. It sounds like it's Matt having problems with his internet. Well, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your time. I think this will be recorded so you can see it on YouTube later. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.